Welcome to Revival Radio TV. Today, we've got an awesome evangelist to bring to you. Can you guess who this is? He's laid hands and prayed for over 2 million people, written 130 books. One of them sold at least 8 million copies. He created a prayer line that's helped more than 23 million prayer requests and miracles that we're following. Wonder who it is? Stay tuned. I was sick and tormented in body and mind and soul. I was losing my very life and existence on this earth. And they told me the story of Jesus of Nazareth, and I believed it. And one night, I turned my face to the wall and told God I'd come to the last mile of the way. And if he didn't help me, there was no hope for me. And I turned to him and said, oh God, save my poor lost soul. Come into my heart. Heal my miserable, afflicted body of tuberculosis and a stuttering, stammering tongue. And the Spirit of God came into me. I felt it going through every fiber of my mortal flesh. And suddenly the power of God was so strong, it just lifted me out of the bed. And I was leaping and shouting for joy. Save for the power of God. You who believe in me shall do the works which I do. I do, and even greater than these, he shall do. What are the works Christ did? Christ delivered the people. Christ touched them with his hands and prayed for them, and they were healed. They touched him, and they were healed. Oh, his mighty miracles of deliverance are so many and outstanding. Who can enumerate them tonight? Christ is saying there'll be no interruption. These miracles shall continue through the people who believe in my name. Everywhere people are turning their attention back to God, and there is a tremendous resurgence of faith in the human heart around this globe of ours. And because of this expectancy, miracles are beginning to happen again. Miracles of healing, miracles of deliverance, miracles for soul, mind, and body. I met a young man at a camp meeting, and the moment I met him, God spoke in my heart and said, that is the man you're supposed to marry. He didn't know it. It took him. <laughs> Isn't it always that way? Uh, he didn't know it for two years. He really didn't know it for two years. And I just said, God, you know, you'll have to work it out. I have no way to do it. I leave it up to you. It's in your hands. If I'm supposed to marry him, you'll have to work it out. And he did. And you know what? I married a miracle. I didn't know it at the time, but I've thought about it so many times since because he had just been healed of tuberculosis three years before we married. That was a miracle. In those days, you didn't get well with tuberculosis. You died, and he was healed by the power of God. And so when people have told me all through the years, well, I don't believe in a miracle, I just always say, well, I live with one. You know, <laughs> I know they're a miracle because I lived with one. Evelyn Roberts was absolutely right, as this book is showing. Or Roberts always described his wife as his darling wife, Evelyn. And yes, she lived with a miracle. God bless a praying mom. And Or Roberts' mother got him started on this adventure. Said someday, God will loose your tongue and you'll talk and you'll preach. And I said, Mama, how could this be? And she said, you'll live to see the day. I want to tell you that I asked God for a fifth child, for a son, have black hair and blue eyes, mm. to be called to preach. And I vowed that if, if he gave him to me, I would dedicate him to God when he was born, and I'd give him back to God. And she is referring back to the scenes in the Bible. And so when I was born, she, she took me to a little church. And there are three great ministers laid their hands on the baby and, and dedicated him to God. And my mother told me that story. She committed her son to God's service. 
It was just a matter of when and how this brave Cherokee mama would get her son out preaching. Yet this didn't seem likely. He was eight years old when he began holding down a job. He ran away from home when he was 15. He found a lifelong love of learning and education, and he wanted more than his parents' third grade education. However, he had blocks to ministry. The first one, he wasn't born again yet. The second one, he stuttered. His mother said one day, God will heal your stammering tongue and you will speak to multitudes. And if stuttering wasn't enough of a block at age 17, he contracted tuberculosis. His grandfather had died of tuberculosis, so everyone knew how serious this really was. This was the era before antibiotics. So as Evelyn Roberts pointed out, tuberculosis was usually fatal. He had been holding down a job, and he was captain of his high school basketball team. His school was 50 miles from his parents' home. He collapsed after game. His coach drives him to his parents' home and delivers his unconscious body to them. When he came to, he told his dad, Papa, I have gone the last mile of the way. He lost so much weight. He was 120 pounds. And remember, he's over six feet tall. All seemed lost. Then his sister Jewel told him, God's going to heal you. Three nights later, his dad prayed his prayer. Lord, I can't bear for my son to die with me knowing he's going to hell. Lord, I can't bear for him to be there. It touched Oral. The most notable moment of his life, he said, was when he accepted Christ. His oldest brother, Elmer, knew a pastor named George Monsey who was doing miracle services. Now, Elmer wasn't born again, but his wife was, and she dragged him to the service. As he watched people being healed, it tormented Elmer to think of losing his own baby brother in days when God had miraculously healed others. Oral couldn't walk. He could hardly sit when his brother Elmer got him to the service. They put him on the stage in a rocking chair stuffed with pillows, his parents sitting on either side of him. Now, he might have been the closest to the pastor during his sermon, but he was the last person to be prayed for. It was 11 o'clock at night. Or Roberts would later use George Monsey's prayer of faith to get thousands of other people healed. Monsey prayed, you foul, tormenting disease, you come out of this boy. You loose him and set him free in Jesus' name. That night, Or Roberts said the miracle presence of God began at his toes and it went all the way up his body. He was instantly healed and he jumped up. He raced around the stage. Not only was the tuberculosis gone, but his stutter was gone too. He would maintain the miracle of not stuttering throughout the rest of his life, his partnership with God. So we jump ahead. Roberts married his darling wife, Evelyn, and Roberts is in college and preaching as a pastor in a North Carolina church. In the universities he would graduate from, his so-called Christian professor said this, it's not God's will to heal, it's that illness, and it was probably put on you to teach you something. This flawed theology disagrees with Jesus' entire ministry, and it disagrees with everything he ever taught. We never see documented anywhere that Jesus ever put illness on a person. Instead, we read Mark 140, and there came a leper to him, begging him on his knees and saying to him, if you're willing, you're able to make me clean. And Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him and saith unto him, I will be thou clean. And the leper was cleansed. It was God's will to heal. And Jesus honored that. And we, you and I, we're to be imitators of Christ. John 10, 10 says, Jesus says, I come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. There's nothing in that scripture that says misery will teach you everything you need to know. Jesus brings life more abundantly. Or Roberts found preaching and a negative social gospel in his churches was just miserable. From Georgia to the church he ran in Enid, Oklahoma, he was looking for better ways to do things and he never lost that passion to learn. He kept earning degrees until he had a master's degree. His accredited honorary doctorate came later due to his notable achievements. So he was at a church-funded university visiting a friend and the sociology professor there said, 
It's impossible for God to make a woman out of a man's rib. In the class of Christians, no one spoke up. Oral was stirred up. At his car, the Lord spoke to him. Son, don't be like other men. Don't be like other preachers. Don't be like your denomination. You be like Jesus and heal the people as he did. And I said, how can I be like Jesus? I don't know how to be like Jesus. And he said, take your Bible and you read the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the book of Acts through three times in 30 days on your knees, and I'll show you Jesus. He took on the teaching, don't please men, be like Jesus. Among his circle of pastors, this was radical. However, his godly mother encouraged him to go for it. He fell in love with Jesus rising from the pages of his Bible. He shared about this in a 1955 tent meeting service. Remember, World War II has just finished and he's pastoring in Enid, Oklahoma. The church where he ministered only exists today in photos, but what happened with his church people changed him forever, in his own words. I preached for 12 years. After God healed me of tuberculosis and a stuttering, stammering tongue, without praying for the sick in any manner. And yet I believed in praying for the sick. I knew God had called me. He had said, son, I'm going to heal you of tuberculosis in a stammering tongue. And you're to take my healing power to your generation. But somehow I'd got lost. I had misunderstood. I had failed. And then in 1947, something happened to me. There was a man who had suffered a terrible accident. He had dropped a heavy object upon his right foot and crushed it. They had called me for prayer. I called a friend and we rushed out there. When we arrived, the man was suffering so intensely, he was rolling on the ground, holding his foot in his hand and hollering at the top of his voice. I was struck with compassion. And before I knew what I had done, I had stooped down and touched his right foot in the name of Christ. I straightened up and stepped back. He stopped rolling on the ground. He stopped hollering. Slowly he got up. He began to work his foot back and forth. He took his shoe off his foot, which had been crushed. He, he stomped his foot on the ground. He said, Brother Roberts, what did you do to me? I said, nothing. I was as scared as he was. He said, yes, you did. I said, no, I didn't. He said, when you touched me, what did you do? I said, I asked Christ to heal you. He said, I'm healed. He said, look at my foot. And look at that heavy object I dropped on it. He said, look, I'm healed. My friend standing by me said, Brother Roberts, can you do that all the time? I said, no. He said, if you could, you could bring a revival to mankind. Then one night I had a dream. And I had this dream every night for several nights. And this is what I saw. I saw the vast majority of all people are sick and afflicted in some way, either in soul, mind, or body, or in all at the same time. And God let me hear the screaming cry of their tormented condition. He let me see the cancer, the tumor, the tuberculosis, the little afflicted children. He let me hear them scream in the night. And that was the dream. What an amazing stirring up God did in him. The Lord told Brother Roberts to fast, reading the four Gospels in the book of Acts. God told him to read each book through three times in a month and to do it on his knees. If he would obey, God promised to show him Jesus. Hearing God, obeying what he said to do, this is a core foundation, a core teaching that blessed him for the rest of his life. So he heads into prayer. I would get on my knees, I would spread my Bible out, and I would read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the book of Acts three different times in 30 days. And at the end of that time, 
God had shown me Jesus of Nazareth. He seemed to rise up from those pages. He seemed to stand up in my presence, and he had a gentle hand on his wrist. He had a tenderness in his spirit. He was filled with love and compassion. And I saw him reaching to the right and reaching to the left, healing the sick, loving little children, reaching out his hands to the whole world to heal them, to save them, and to make them whole. He said, now, you be like that. And you heal the people as he healed them. Then I knew I would have to do it. I knew I didn't have the power and I didn't have the courage. So I went to my little study, locked the door, fell on the floor, and told God I would never rise until he spoke to me and let me have his power. How long I lay on the floor, I'll never know because I didn't watch the time. Time seemed to merge with eternity, and as I lay there, I felt like a tiny spot in this vast universe. I prayed, and I beseeched God to give me his power. If I was to be like Jesus and heal the people as he healed them, I would have to have his power and his anointing. And then he spoke to me. He spoke like a military general. He said, stand on your feet. I got up. He said, go get in your car. I did. He said, drive one block and turn right. I did. When I did that, he said, now, son, from this hour, you will heal the sick and cast out devils by my power. I felt... I felt the flow in of God's power. I felt something going through me like electricity. The Lord said to him that night, I'm going to heal you and you will take my healing power to your generation. That finally got to him until he couldn't stand it. He sought God. He laid in the floor. He cried out to God. He, he, he just stayed with it, and he 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 stayed with it. I mean, he didn't quit. He got to where he just, he just wake up outside someplace. Same thing happened to Kenneth Hagin. Because this great move of God and miracles were taking place right after World War II, and the church in World War II got into a pitiful mess because a lot of pastors went to work in the defense plants because of money, money and never did go back into the ministry. Didn't know enough about faith. But Oral Roberts and Kenneth Hagin turned it around. And Oral Roberts changed the complexion of the United States about healing and miracles, and then the world. Yes. Are you inspired? You may or may not have ever heard God tell you things like Oral Roberts describes, but God loves to partner with us. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, so we know that we can. It's not always going to be smooth sailing when you expand into something new. In 1991, Pastor Terry Copeland Pearsons is at EMIC church service where Or Roberts preached. She took a few moments to update us on the Roberts family. She pointed out what I described as one of their secret weapons. Evelyn Roberts, a woman of faith and prayer. Watch Pastor Terry share an anointed insider viewpoint. I want you to know this is a, a woman of God, but she's a mother of the faith. You, you just can't imagine in our generation in this day, you can't imagine what it was like 50 years ago when no one supported you, when no one liked what you were doing and everyone, everyone was against you, your, your family, the church family, everyone. And they stood together in faith. And I tell you, I know that Oral could not have done and obeyed God the way he did if it had not been for this wonderful, Amen. wonderful woman of God. Amen. Amen. When we look at trailblazing first, Oral and Evelyn Roberts pioneer, you'll see that God's bigger than any attack that can happen and any challenge we face. As they surmounted the impossible, we too can do exactly that. People can handle meetings where many accepted Christ, but when you add healing and miracle services, everyone took notice. Oral Roberts might be one of the few who can say their ministry began with a bang. Listen, he was preaching in a large crowd. Well, 
Let me let you hear it in his own words. He shot twice, and I didn't really connect with the shots, but someone called the police, and they picked him up and put him in jail, and I went on with the service, and the police called me the next day and asked me to come down to the jail and to talk to this man. And I did. I went in the cell, and, and they told me the whole story. By, by that time, it was everywhere because when I picked up the paper the, the next morning, the headline was, Young Evangelist is Almost Assassinated, Oral Roberts. It hit the news coast to coast, and in a few days, he had every news venue trying to contact him. Preachers were flying in asking, will you come to our city? He had more invitations than he could possibly take. So he steps it up. His newest tent held 12,000 people. He left the flaps up and let the people stand outside. He saw 25,000 people standing and sitting in that tent every service. See this book, Expect a Miracle? In a negative social gospel that saw God as petty, punishing, or cruel, to publish Expect a Miracle was radical. In Melbourne, Australia, in 1956, he was in a car with Evelyn. Mobs tried to overturn his vehicle with him and his wife in it. Here you have thousands experiencing life-changing healings and miracles, but he's forced out of town. Australia was so shocked by this near-death experience, they enacted laws to stop it ever repeating again. We see now the decades of Oral Roberts' amazing ministry. Two million people healed and blessed. It might be hard to imagine they were ever starting out tested by fire. Could what they believed be stronger than anything Satan could do? Well, believers loved the healing services, but the news media hated them. They told the people, don't go, it's a fraud. All the negative opposition, however, became free advertising. People did show up. After World War II, we had people come home with injuries and illnesses no one had ever heard of. There were no antibiotics. Now, in this next clip with Kenneth Copeland, Brother Roberts gets real, explaining how it was when he began. I'm watching you, and I, when I first met him, I thought he was 14 feet tall. And you, you, you were scared. Yes, I was. Well, let me tell you how I was scared. When the Lord called me into the healing ministry, and I had the confrontation, I mean, he had the confrontation with me, and I confronted right back uh, he told me that I, that I was to take his healing power to my generation. I couldn't, I couldn't take that in. But he then directed me to have my first healing service. Ask a person to get saved and convince them to come down, but you really don't know they're saved. There's, unless there's a shining face or something, that, that you can believe they're saved, but only God and that person knows they're saved. But in healing... If they have a gorder hanging on their neck and you pray and it, it's gone, you can tell. If it's still there, it's still there. I mean, it's a serious deal. And like you, I had not been in that except I had been healed. And I said, Lord, what if I fail? And just as clearly he said, you have already done that. Mm -hmm. And all you can do is to go up. You can't go down any further. And folks, that was since so serious with me. I knew if I didn't pray for the healing of the people that uh, it wouldn't go well with me. And I took it serious. And the preachers were sitting on the platform who had not entered the healing ministry. And many were there because their people demanded that they come and they were not quite for it in the 50s and 60s and you could feel them just right in your back as they, as they sit, sat back of you and they were watching and many of them instead of watching for the one to get healed were watching for those that didn't get healed and I was the stucky in this deal I was under the command of God to do it, and these people were watching my failures, and the media had their cameras right in front of me. This was brand, not brand new, but it was uh, quite new. I, I wasn't the only one, but there wasn't too many of us out there. 
We were scarce as hen's teeth. And uh, when we, we began to pray, but here's what I discovered that really won the victory. The people were for it. Mm -hmm. They were so anxious to see one person healed. You have been in an automobile accident November 1st, 1957, seriously injured. You had both legs broken, your neck has been broken, and your spine. And uh, there's an affliction in your lungs. Your right hand is paralyzed. I can't feel anything with my left hand. Do you fully believe Christ is able to do this? I know he is. Christ, I touch her because you tell me to touch her, and I believe for her healing. Stretch forth your hands. Open and close them. No. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Let's help her rejoice. Shake my right hand. Yes, you have life. Shake this hand. Oh, you do have life. Now, how does your... Look straight at me. Your eyes are clear. Yes, they are as clear as a bell. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad. It takes being hungry for God. However, God wants to share and bless you. Rejoice. Or Robert said, for every person healed, more than seven others would come forward asking to accept Christ as their Lord. He obeyed God and the healing revival of 1947 happened. I announced I was going to pray for the sick. And I asked God to give me 1,000 people to supply the financial need and to heal the people so that both they and I would know I was called to pray for the sick. God gave me all three. He gave me the crowd. He supplied the need. He healed the people. And the first one was an old German mother who for 38 years had had a crippled hand like that. And when I touched her hand in Christ's name, it opened. And she screamed, see? See, see my hand, it's healed, it's free. I never shall forget her face when her hand opened and she was healed. And from that hour, the crowds began to come. 3,000 a night, 5,000, 10,000. Our last campaign, our most recent meeting, 13,500 a night average was in the big tent. According to the Oral Roberts Evangelistic Association, he would lay hands on two million people who were healed and miraculously delivered. Think about it. Two million households saw everything change because of the power of Almighty God. Yes, healing is for today. Yes, expect a miracle. God is good and he's here for you. We'll see you next time right here on Revival Radio TV.